welcome to a tutorial on the pancreas as an endocrine gland. Now the pancreas serves two functions, an exocrine function and an endocrine function. But our focus here will be on the pancreatic islets, which are specific cells in the pancreas that are designed to secrete insulin and glucagon. Now the function of insulin is to decrease circulating blood sugar levels, and the function of glucagon is to increase blood sugar levels. The insulin is produced by beta cells in the pancreatic islets, and the glucagon is produced by alpha cells in the pancreatic islets. So we're going to begin by diagramming the interaction between these two hormones and how they help maintain homeostatic blood glucose levels. So when we're looking at the pancreas, we're looking at a structure that is located on the left side of the body, just underneath the stomach and the spleen, and the head of the pancreas is going to be wrapped in the duodenum. So I can draw this sort of C-shaped section here, which is going to be part of my small intestine. And then the pancreas is going to sit here in this tissue, and it is glandular tissue, so it's lobular, and it is an organ that is significantly different than what we would find for most of our capsulated organs. And the pancreas here is going to be responding to changes in blood glucose levels. Now this illustration is going to go a little bit differently than you've seen previously because this organ has the capacity to produce two types of hormones, insulin and glucagon, which are going to have opposing effects. So for example, if I have elevations in blood glucose, so BG stands for blood glucose, those elevations in blood glucose will be having an effect on the pancreas, and the pancreas is going to do a couple of things. In response to elevated amounts of blood glucose, it is going to begin secretion of insulin, from the beta cells of the pancreatic islets, and then also we're going to decrease the synthesis of glucagon because they have opposing effects, and the glucagon is produced by the alpha cells. So when blood glucose levels are elevated, the pancreas responds by increasing insulin and decreasing glucagon. This is going to decrease blood glucose levels. And when I decrease blood glucose levels, I should then get back to homeostasis. Okay, and any time that I get away from homeostasis because my blood glucose levels have elevated, I'm going to promote the production of more insulin to help decrease the amount of blood glucose. However, we find that blood glucose levels may be too high, but blood glucose levels could be too low as well. So, if the blood glucose levels, for example, continue to decline, and I get this depression in the amount of blood glucose levels, now I need my pancreas to do the opposite effect. So, this time, when blood glucose levels are low, the insulin amounts are going to decrease. The beta cells are going to stop producing insulin. And the alpha cells are going to pick up their production of glucagon. When glucagon levels elevate, they target the liver to begin secretion of glycogen. And that's going to liberate some glucose into the bloodstream. So my blood glucose levels will raise and those blood glucose levels will bring me back to homeostasis again. And then any time those blood glucose levels fall again away from homeostasis, that's going to kick in the secretion of glucagon. So we've got basically a figure eight shape here. Any time the blood glucose levels are elevated, this is going to trigger the pancreas to primarily produce insulin, decrease glucagon secretion to help regulate those blood glucose levels back to homeostatic normals. And if the blood glucose levels fall too low, for example, if somebody had too much insulin released or perhaps gave themselves a dose of insulin, then we're going to see the pancreas start producing and kick up the production of glucagon from the alpha cells to help elevate those blood glucose levels back to normal. Now, in addition to the pancreas, we also find that there are some effects 
of the parasympathetic and sympathetic system on the pancreas. So anytime that blood glucose levels are elevating, because for example, perhaps we ate something recently, that's going to kick in the production of insulin. And this can occur because of parasympathetic stimulation of the pancreas. So the pancreas is monitoring blood glucose levels, but in addition, it's directly linked to the autonomic nervous system. So during those rest and digest phases, we can be kicking up the amount of insulin and be getting the blood glucose to lower and go into targeted cells. On the flip side, we also can see that sympathetic stimulation can cause the release of our glucagon. So during sympathetic activity, we have an increased demand of the tissues for energy to help us with the fight or flight response. And so that sympathetic stimulation can also cause the pancreas to release the glucagon to help elevate the amounts of circulating blood glucose. So this will take place when the adrenal medulla secretes epinephrine and that epinephrine is going to help increase the blood glucose amounts. Okay, so part of this sympathetic response is directly related to epinephrine as it comes from the medulla of the adrenal gland. Now circulating levels of blood glucose are going to be important in maintaining a whole host of effects. So when insulin is released, the idea is to cause the liver to store some of the excess sugar, to stimulate the adipose cells and the muscle cells to store sugar or take sugar up, and insulin is also regulated, I should say insulin is also monitored by the hypothalamus to help with that feeling of satiety after having eaten. Now, glycogen is going to have opposing effects. So glycogen is going to cause the liver to liberate stored glycogen, which is the complex molecule of glucose. Some of the adipose tissue and muscle may also liberate some fatty acids, some glucose into circulation. And glucagon is going to travel directly to the liver from the pancreas. So, you may be wondering, why is it that I get hungry? Well, when you get hungry, it's an insulin action on the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus is detection of that insulin that I mentioned just a moment ago. Anytime you get polyphagia, you're getting hunger with high blood glucose. If you have polydipsia, you're gonna have an elevated thirst. And if you have polyuria, you're gonna have an increased urine production. So what are insulin and glucagon. Well, these are protein hormones that have a relatively short half-life. They're going to instigate the G protein mechanisms of a secondary messenger system at the site of cells. And it's important for us to have a rapidly metabolizing insulin or glucagon so that we can make quick changes to levels of circulating blood glucose. So what happens when I have hyposecretion of insulin and hypersecretion of insulin? Insulin certainly seems to have the most dramatic effect on blood glucose levels over glucagon because there are other mechanisms in place to help increase blood glucose levels aside from glucagon. So for example, epinephrine or growth hormone or thyroid hormones can have a direct impact on the circulating amounts of blood glucose levels. So we're going to talk about insulin specifically. Now, hyposecretion of insulin is the main characteristic of a type 1 diabetic. In a type 1 diabetic, the beta cells of the pancreatic islet stop producing insulin. So although the cells have receptors that would bind to insulin, the body isn't producing insulin. So if insulin isn't produced, there's no checks and balances system to prevent hyperglycemia. And we're going to see patients suffering from hyperglycemia when they have hyposecretion of insulin. In addition, we're going to see weight loss with increased appetite. So we're going to see the body is going to be liberating fat 
It's going to be liberating glycogen from the liver in an attempt to increase blood glucose levels, even though the insulin isn't working. We're going to have an increased appetite because the cells aren't getting the energy. They can't get the blood glucose from the blood into the cells. Um, so another way to look at this is that these cells are essentially wasting away. They're starving because they can't get the glucose that they need to fuel their metabolic processes. We're also going to see an increased production of hyperosmotic urine. What this means is that a lot of the extra glucose is going to be lost through the kidneys. Now a lot of times you'll hear people say, oh, the extra glucose spills over into the urine, but this is the wrong analogy. What's going on is that you have a certain number of receptors to collect glucose from the urine. And once you have filled up all these receptors, once you have maximized all the receptors in use, then there are no more receptors available to take more of the glucose in. So when I get more glucose in the blood, I get more glucose than in the urine. And when I have glucose molecules in the urine, this is going to change the osmotic gradients and more water will be lost in urine. A person with chronic hyposecretion of insulin will eventually die, and that could be caused by acidosis unless we can get treatment to the patient. Long-term hyperglycemia that would be related to hyposecretion of insulin can cause a number of signs and symptoms of which we see with diabetic patients. First of all, the vision is going to be affected as well as hearing. This has to do with loss of blood vessels to the eye as well as neuropathy to the eye. Individuals that have hyperglycemia, long-term hyperglycemia, may have impotence. There may be erectile dysfunctions associated with this. In addition, the chronic hyperglycemia is going to cause neuropathy and death of nerve cells, as well as damage to the cardiovascular system. This has to do with irritation of blood vessels, as well as potential damage to the heart. And then also because of elevated blood pressure, as well as the additional work that the kidney is doing to try to clear out this abundance in glucose, we can lead to kidney disease. Hypersecretion of insulin occurs when an individual consumes too much glucose or spikes blood glucose level. When too much sugar is loaded into the blood, the pancreas responds by releasing large amounts of insulin. And if too much insulin is released, then we can create a situation called reactive hypoglycemia, where so much insulin is released that we overdo it and create a situation of low blood glucose levels. And we see a side effect of type 2 diabetes. So in type 2 diabetes, the receptors out in the tissues, either at the liver, the muscle, or in the fat cells, become insensitive to insulin. They lack the receptors for the target hormone. So the G protein mechanisms, that second messenger system, breaks down. If the receptors are not responding to the hormone, the pancreas is going to respond by producing more insulin and more insulin and more insulin. So we're going to get large amounts of insulin circulating until the pancreas hits a wall, basically, and stops producing because it's worn itself out. So early stages of type 2 diabetics will have elevated amounts of insulin. There's some side effects to elevated amounts of insulin. Insulin in large doses also causes irritation to the cardiovascular system. And irritation to the cardiovascular system can lead to neuropathy. Now hypersecretion of insulin and our normal receptors, and the receptors are responding to the insulin, I'm going to see a hypoglycemic patient. This patient is going to have low blood glucose levels. Because they have little energy, these patients are going to suffer from dizziness and lightheadedness as well as muscle fatigue. They're going to be lethargic because their muscles don't have the energy to function. But in addition, the brain cells also aren't getting enough blood glucose levels, and so we'll see a mental lethargy. These patients may or may have massive amounts of confusion. I know of an individual who had a hyper secretion of insulin, was hypoglycemic and actually got confused at an intersection and pulled into the wrong lane of traffic. So the big picture here is that the pancreas is influencing blood glucose levels. Anytime that blood glucose levels rise, insulin should be released by beta cells and when blood glucose levels fall, glucagon should be released by alpha cells.
In addition to the release of insulin and glucagon, we see that the pancreas will respond to parasympathetic and sympathetic stimulations and have a response again to help try to maintain blood glucose levels.